this afternoon, we are all very honored that Professor Samuel Vera Cruz came out of retirement to give us this timely lecture on philosophical counseling. Um, affectionately called Sir Sam or Sir Sammy by his students, Professor Vera Cruz was a faculty of the UP Department of Philosophy for 38 years. He specializes in philosophy of science and epistemology, especially in virtue epistemology. Many of my colleagues here and most of the alumni who are here will probably say the same thing that we learned about, um, for example, Thomas Kuhn, uh, the structure of scientific revolutions through Sir Sam. Um, aside from these fields, he also taught a variety of courses in the undergraduate and graduate levels, including philosophical analysis, um, speculative thought, uh, philosophical problems, contemporary philosophy. But more than his academic accomplishments, it is Sir Sam's ethics, his work ethics, and warmth that makes him well loved by his students and his colleagues. So in terms of the topic for this afternoon, um, I actually first heard the term philosophical counseling in the early 2000s through Sir Sam himself. So I know that his research interest in this topic is in-depth and scientific, so I'm really looking forward to it. His topic for this afternoon is not only interesting, um, but rather it is actually necessary in these uncertain times. Um, we are all suffering from some sort of angst, um, anxiety, depression from everything that's been happening. So I think that this is um, a topic that we will all um, appreciate. So without further ado, on behalf of my colleagues at the Department of Philosophy and the entire UP community, please join me in welcoming back one of the philosophers that certainly influenced me and all of us, Professor Sam Veracruz. Good afternoon to everyone. First, I would like to express my greetings and congratulations to the faculty and chair of the UP Department of Philosophy for inviting me to deliver an inaugural, inaugural presentation in the Ricardo Lecture Series to honor and respect the legacy of the late Dr. Ricardo Pascual, the father of analytic philosophy in the Philippines. My lecture today is about philosophical counseling. The public face of philosophical counseling movement in the United States and arguably in the entire world is this guy, Lou Marinoff, a philosopher and professor of philosophy at the City College of New York and the author of the best-selling book, non-fiction book entitled Not Prosa. Uh, Plato, not prosa. In introducing to you the topic, I first would like to present to you a case involving Lou Marinoff. The case of Lou Marinoff versus the City College of New York. On January 10, 2002, Lou Marinoff brought an action seeking damages against several City College of New York officials for violation of his First Amendment rights. Plaintiff Lou Marinoff alleged that the respondents violated his rights when they imposed a moratorium on his on-campus philosophical, philosophical counseling activities pending a legal review of such activities. The background of this case are these. Prior to the moratorium, he engaged in two types of 
philosophical counseling activities on college campus, a private practice of philosophical counseling and research about philosophical counseling. He did not charge a fee for his private clients, but gently asked them only to make a donation to his organization, the American Philosophical Practitioners Association. Based partly on his research, he was able to publish three books, namely Plato Not Prozac, Applying Eternal Wisdom to Everyday Problems, two, Philosophical Practice, and three, The Big Questions, How Philosophy Can Change Your Life. Based Based on his research, he was also able to present the course of philosophical Based on his research, he was also able to make presentations about philosophical counseling in many campuses of American universities. Now, at that time, there was also an institution at the college which is called the Wellness Center. The Wellness Center provides student services with immunization services, psychological counseling services, social work services concerning health, emergency medical care, and other health services. In 1999, Lou Marinoff, together with the Vice President for Student Affairs, developed an initiative for the inclusion of philosophical counseling service as part of the menu of the Wellness Center. The service to be provided is supposed to be handled by the members of the American Philosophical Practitioners Association that is headed by Lou Marino. One half of the funding of the service will be shouldered by the APPA and one half of the funding would be shouldered by the college. So that was the proposal made by Marinoff to the college. And so the college press went on to advertise the beginning of the service, but unfortunately, it never received an official approval. For several months, the initiative was kept in limbo. That is the case because presumably at that time, the university officials were concerned with a lot of issues about the proposal. First, they wanted to have time to ascertain the legal feasibility of the project. Number two, they were also concerned about the harm that philosophical counseling may bring upon to the students. Number three, they were concerned about the emergence of oppositional resistance to philosophical practice in the press and within the academy. A persistent theme of the opposition to this practice was that supposedly if there are mental therapy issues with individuals, they should seek professional help from licensed psychiatrists or licensed psychological counselors and not unlicensed philosophical practitioners. So on November 7, 2000, Lou Marinoff was directed by the City College to immediately cease and desist or stop all philosophical counseling activities in the college until such time that 
the legal department of the college can pass a review on it. And so the moratorium was imposed and it included a moratorium on his research activities. Initially, Lou Marinov cooperated with the legal department of the college to facilitate a legal review. But then in January 10, 2002, Lou Marinov was impatient and so he filed the case against the city college. In April 2002, during the hearing of the case, both parties came up with a temporary stipulation that pending the conclusion of the legal review, Lou Marinop shall not engage in philosophical counseling that involves payment of counselees and the scheduling of PC sessions. Now, in April of 2002, the District Court of New York dismissed the case for lack of subject matter jurisdiction and failure to state a claim. Specifically, it says that the defendants in their individual capacities were immune from suit for damages. Also, that the plaintiff Lou Marinoff failed to state a valid claim for violations of the First Amendment. In July 2002, maybe that was about two months after the decision was made, the legal review of the college was completed and the moratorium was ended. The legal review concluded that first, the city college was free to choose to enter into a contract between the APPA, that is the Organization of Philosophical Counselors headed by Marinov, to provide philosophical counseling at the wellness center, provided that insurance requirements for the organization and its counselors are met. Similarly, the City College is free to enter into a contract or agreement with Marinov to conduct philosophical counseling activities on campus, again provided that he would meet certain insurance requirements. And three, Lou Marinov was free to engage in any research that has been given prior approval by the College Institutional Review Board because research on philosophical counseling involved the participation of human subjects. So the moratorium ended with these findings of the legal department of the college. But there is still the case that was dismissed by the District Court of New York. Lou Marinoff appealed the verdict, appealed the verdict of the lower court and went to the appellate court. He appealed only with respect to the dismissal of the First Amendment claim. And so it was brought to the appellate court, but the appellate court later on invalidated the dismissal of the case by the lower court and remanded the case back to the lower court. So the case was again heard by the lower court. But this time, the only hearing that is to be made is whether or not the moratorium violated the First Amendment rights of Marinov. 
about three months later of hearing the case, the court came up with a verdict. The court said that there was no violation of the plaintiff's First Amendment rights by the imposition of the moratorium. The defendant's concern, meaning the concern of the college over potential harm and liability were reasonable and it outweighed the value of the research and counseling activities of Marinov. And so that was the end of the case. Marinov never ended it, but it, of course, it only popularized the cause of philosophical counseling. Now, I am citing this case because I want it to be a source of topics or things that we would have to reflect on as we continue to discuss the merits or the merits of philosophical counseling as a practice. I now proceed to share with you some of the things that I know about philosophical counseling movement. Some of the things I will share are probably already familiar to some of you, but my purpose in sharing is to get you involved in a serious consideration of the viability of philosophical counseling practice in the Philippines. And by practice, I mean professional practice, one that can be engaged in meaningfully and gainfully by those who have done real hard work in the study of philosophy. This early, I would like to make clear that I am not a practicing philosophical counselor. I am, however, an enthusiastic student of the movement and have been following up the developments that are going on in the fields since I was introduced to the movement upon reading the book of Lou Marino, Plato, not Prosa. The title of the book is very apt in introducing the idea of philosophical counseling into the arena of public consciousness. There is an implied provocation in the title of the book that if one is suffering, say, from a psychological disturbance like depression or anxiety, do not take that popular medicine called Prozac. Instead, turn for help to Plato or to the philosophers. Indeed, the first time I heard of philosophical counseling, images came up to me about the possibility of philosophers side by side with psychologists or psychological counselors and psychotherapists doing something to help their fellow human beings who are disturbed mentally, spiritually, or whatever the disturbance there might be. So what is philosophical counseling? What is philosophical counseling? There are various definitions that have been given about the practice, but there seems to be a unanimity about it. Lou Marinov, for instance, in his deposition to the court, in 2002 says philosophical counseling other slide, is helping people apply philosophy to their management and resolution 
of their everyday problems. Another is philosophical counseling consists of a trained philosopher helping an individual deal with a problem or an issue that is concerned to that individual. And so we can then say that it is simply a form of counseling that uses philosophy, its theories and ways of critical thinking to help counselees address ordinary problems of living. For most advocates, there are three settings within which philosophical counseling may be conducted. The first one is the traditional face-to-face, one-on-one dialogue between two people, the counselor and the counselee. The second one is group counseling. It is sometimes known as group facilitation. Here, the client is usually a small group of individuals with common concerns or problems, and the practitioner facilitates the dialogical conversation towards the goal of getting every participant profit intellectually or emotionally from the encounter. Incidentally, this group counseling, in, in this category of group counseling, philosophers usually put philosophy for, philosophy for, for children under it. So philosophy for children is considered by philosophical counseling practitioners as a form of philosophical group counseling. And the third form of counseling is what they call organizational consulting. In this context, the counselee is an organization procuring the assistance of philosophical counseling practitioners in clarifying and sorting out company missions, goals, and practices that are concern of the field corporate social responsibility. In most cases, philosophical consultants in organizational contexts partner with other management consultants coming from different backgrounds. It is to this category that the practice of business ethics counseling belong. In all these contexts, the practitioner engages in philosophical dialogue with the client in order to help solve client's problem. It is worth noting that in the traditional or widespread notion of counseling, the context of counseling practice is limited to the first, that is on the one-on-one -on -one, uh, face-to-face interaction. So going back to our conception of philosophical counseling, it is counseling of people as individuals or groups that make use of the insights, methods, theories, and wise counsels of philosophers that have been accumulated throughout the ages in alleviating suffering, distress, anxiety, fears, and unhappiness arising from our relationship with the world, from our relationship with others, and even our relationship with ourselves. In short, it's a philosophical practice used to improve the quality of our daily lives. Now, what are the motivations for the practice? What motivates people to go into philosophical counseling? Or at least what motivates the philosophers to go into counseling? One is the desire for relevance. It's actually the effort of philosoph philosophers to make their practice more relevant to everyday life. Number two, these philosophers who, go to, who want to go to counseling are motivated to correct the tendency of psychotherapists 
and psychologists to medicalize most of the personal emotional problems of individuals. They say that not all who go to counseling are mentally sick. And that's true. A lot of people who go to counseling are often misdiagnosed as having psychological problems when in fact they just have certain philosophical issues with themselves. The point may be illustrated this way. A philosophy student goes to counseling and says, I have been reading Albert Camus. He has read Albert Camus, The Strangers. Uh, yes, The Stranger. And then he now says to the counselor, I am now contemplating to commit suicide. How would a psychological counselor react to this? To many psychologists, thoughts of committing suicide is already a clear symptom of psychological illness. But to a philosopher, thoughts about the commission of suicide is not necessarily a psychological illness. It is a deep It is a deep engagement with some of the issues of what it means to be a human being. And so, it is this example that we can probably say that there could really be a difference between psychological problems and philosophical problems. It is in many cases that what are diagnosed as psychological problems may simply be consequences of harboring unjustified beliefs, ill-considered metaphysical views, erroneous reasoning, or badly skewed thinking. So those are some of the motivations of Philosophers who want to go to counseling practice, desire for relevance, and that not all problems are psychological problems. And of course, the, there's a third one. It is to remind fellow philosophers that philosophy is not simply academic philosophy within the hallowed walls of the academy. Academic philosophy right now is mostly remote from the concerns of people in everyday life. And perhaps this is one of the reasons for the prevalent undervaluation of philosophy by many people today. PC practitioners intend to recover the original idea of philosophy as an activity of caring for the soul or philosophy as a way of life that is a way of living guided by wisdom and enhanced by its pursuit. Yeah. Now, what are the target clientele or clients of philosophical counseling? Who are the, who are the people deemed to benefit from philosophical counseling, counseling services. A cursory look and see into existing philosophical counseling website yields some very general and specific profiles of possible candidates that may be helped by PC. Individuals whose problems are focused on one, issues of private morality or professional practice. Two, issues of value, meaning, or 
purpose. Three, issues of personal or professional fulfillment. Four, issues of underdetermined or inconsist inconsistent belief systems. And five, issues requiring any philosophical interpretation of changing circumstances. In this slide that will be shown, uh, there is a specific listing made by the NPCA about the kinds of people that may benefit from philosophical counseling services. Do you have it? Uh, Technical difficulties. Sorry. Okay. At any rate, I read them for the benefit of the audience. The candidates, possible candidates, would be people having moral issues work-related stress, political, political issues and disagreements, writer's block, time management issues, procrastination, career issues, job loss, problems with co-workers, disability issues, retirement, aging, end-of-life issues, mid-life issues, adult children of aging parents, problems with family, family planning, in-law issues, breakups and divorce, parenting issues, finding one is adopted, pulling in and out of love, loss of a family member, friendship issues, peer pressure. So there are so many. After all, philosophical counselors take their practice as a therapy for the same. And these are usually the kinds of problems associated with sane people. At this point, we have to take note that philosophical counselors do recognize that there are boundaries between cases that they can handle competently and those that they cannot. In other words, uh, philo Philosophical counselors are prudent enough that there are cases that they cannot also handle. They will agree that they do not and cannot handle cases of mental disorders as treated by psychiatrists. Not all mental problems are philosophical problems. And so they're quite, uh, they're, they're quite familiar with the saying, if your only tool is a hammer, do not look everything you work on as a nail. <laughs> All right. So, uh, earlier on in the development of the movement, there were a lot of disagreements among the practitioners themselves. But as the years went by, they have come up with some form of general consensus. They've attained a good level of consensus. The general consensus that have been arrived at by practitioners are essentially the following. First, they believe that there is indeed a form of dialogue of a philosophical nature in a philosophical encounter. This dialogue is usually con uh, called a Socratic dialogue, conducted for the purpose of getting the counselee to become self-reflective. It is a means of getting the counselee here from herself articulate what she believes is her problem or issues. Now, there is therefore an effort on the part of the counselor to make the guest or counselee realize that she can philosophize 
by knowing more of herself and her issues. Now, related to this, there is supposedly an induced philosophical midwifery taking place. The counselor assists her client to give birth to her own views and insights into her condition. The client is considered an autonomous person needing no direction from another. So you allow the client to bring out his own views about her own problem and get her to hear what her own problems are from herself. Now, in this dialogical encounter, the counselor supposedly have, helps her client to develop and refine a faculty of mostly students of philosophy, the faculty called philosophical sensibility. This is the capacity to appreciate dimensions of personal meanings value or significance in one's thoughts, behavior, or experiences. Philosophical sensibility is like a pair of eyeglasses that allows one to pick up or receive the philosophical dimensions of one's life that one might not be able to pick up without putting them on. So, these are some of the goals of the philosophical dialogue in the encounter. So that's the first agreed upon method for doing philosophical counseling practice. Number two is that, or the next one is the philosophical counseling is considered a guest. He is not a patient. It's not a patient who needs treatment according to a diagnosis using a manual for the identification of mental problems or disorders. Now note that this feature of counseling, philosophical counseling, sets it apart from the practice of psychotherapy. The, the counselee is not a patient. He is not medicalized. He is not considered ill. Number three, or the next one, is that the counselee must meet certain minimal requirements of competency to engage in a meaningful conversation and rational inquiry. The counselee must exhibit a reasonably good level of ability to think autonomously and critically. So this is, uh, I think not in the, not in the slide, but this is something that I am adding right now, that philosophical counselors agree that the counselee at least that they are taking in is one who, of course, can meet minimum competency requirements. It must be that the counselee can engage, of course, in a meaningful conversation and some form of rational inquiry. The next one is there must be an ability on the part of the counselor to, acad to adapt academic philosophy to his practice. Now, this is a tough requirement for one to be able to engage in philosophical counseling practice. It takes a time, it takes a lot of time and effort for anyone to distill the lessons about life and extract nuggets of wisdom from the voluminous works of philosophers, reading 
interpreting or understanding them alone is already a formidable task. What more if one needs to translate the thoughts of philosophers to a wider audience that has no previous exposure to philosophy? The task, of course, is hard, but it can be done. The next point of consensus is this. There is supposed to be a cooperative counselor-client rela relationship. The counseling process is a shared project involving mutual respect for each other, reciprocal exchange of insight and information, collaborative learning, creativity, and discovery. The metaphor for this collaboration and cooperation is the one that was given by Michael Russell. He calls it a dance. So it is like a dance when there is an encounter between the counselor and the counselee. And the other point, and which is the last one in this point, in in detailing the general point of consensus among practitioners is this. There is a form of philosophical instruction going on in the encounter. But the instruction is for the benefit not only of the counselee but of the counsellor himself. So this is not the same as teaching or an instruction between a teacher and a student. So those are the points of general consensus for philosophical practitioners. I know that they're still quite general, but this may be later on perhaps uh, uh, be even given greater detail and attention in our open forum. So let's go to the next. Owing to the fact that philosophical counselors are new entrants to a vast field of client counseling, they take it upon themselves to explain what their practice is all about, what makes it truly distinct and separate from the already existing or established forms of counseling. In this effort, they have been much more concentrated in demarcating their practice from those being done by psychologists and psychotherapists because there are obviously some overlaps of goals, principles, and methods. PC or philosophical practitioners not all of them anyway, want to say that they are not duplicating the job of psychologists as far as counseling is concerned. The philosophers insist that what they practice is truly demarcated from those being done by their counterparts in psychology. This is philosophical counseling's problem of demarcation. The demarcation problem asks, what makes philosophical counseling philosophical? I will cite several answers to this question that I have found in the literature. The first one says, the extensive use of philosophical methods and skills in the entire counseling process is what makes it philosophical. It resides in the de deployment of the Socratic method of dialogue and skills associated with philosophical training, such as critical thinking, conceptual clarification and analysis, logical reasoning. So these are the methods and skills that are distinctively philosophical and they got deployed 
in the counseling encounter. Another one, however, is this. It's one that has been proposed by a practitioner named Ran Lahab. Ran Lahab objects to the first view. He says that the use of Socratic method of inquiry and critical thinking is not exclusive to philosophy. The application of such method and of skills of general application to a particular activity will not by itself turn that activity as philosophical. And so what he proposes is what he calls worldview interpretation. It goes like this. A person's actions are almost always related to her worldview or network of beliefs used to interpret her surrounding world. Emotional and behavioral problems are mostly rooted in the deficiencies and mistaken elements of this network of beliefs. Hence, philosophical counseling is constituted in its essence by a careful examination and review of the worldview of clients with the goal of constructing a better one. Exposition and critical examination of worldviews is a specialty job of philosophers. And if one brings that to counseling practice, then that practice is philosophical. So that's the point of view of Ran Laha. Worldview interpretation is the hallmark of counseling, philosophical counseling. The third one is that is, is the third one is one that is associated with uh, Eliot D. Cohen. It is what it is what is sometimes known as logic-based therapy, or for short, LBT. For LBT proponents, what makes philosophical counseling encounter philosophical resides in the exposition review and critical analysis of the logical reasoning that goes into the constitution of a person's beliefs, emotions, dispositions, and actions. Now he says, or at least Eliot says that this kind of therapy calls LBT has a close resemblance with a practice in psychology known as rational emotive behavioral therapy or REBT associated with Edward Ellis. So that is the third one. That is the third one, the third proposal. The, the fourth one is a view coming from an existential therapist, namely Amy Van Dorsen. Amy Van Dorsen says that there are many personal problems brought to the counseling room that are mostly existential problems. Human vulnerabilities to anxiety, despair, fear of loss, and death are the substance of philosophical counseling. And this is supposedly from his own experience as a psychotherapist too. And so he says that philosophical counseling are focused precisely on these issues. And because of this, Van Dorsen believes that there is almost a ready-made natural niche of philosophical counseling in the counseling practices or within the counseling practices. So these are a survey of uh, the views of some philosophers on how they have tackled the problem of demarcation. In the end, I believe that the differences of these PC practitioners on how to pin down that which is philosophical in a PC encounter 
actually depend on what they take to be philosophically salient in the activity. Some take the methodology as salient. Others take salience to be on the philosophical subject matter being brought to the counseling table. So what they are actually having is what is known as, or what I would call as the method and skills argument, that, that's number one, and number two, the topic argument. The first says that what makes philosophical counseling philosophical is the use of a philosophical method and skills in the counseling process. The second says that what makes philosophical counseling philosophical resides in the topic being addressed in the, in the counseling encounter. My take on this issue is to combine both arguments. So for a counseling practice to have a distinct philosophical character, first, it must be the case that the subject matter or topic addressed in the encounter is one that is traditionally housed in the discipline of philosophy. And second, the method and skills deployed to pursue the goals of the encounter are such that they are methods and skills dedicatedly formed by and through philosophical education and training. But even if we know some of these answers to this demarcation problem, there is still the much more detailed question. And this is the question about whether philosophical counseling is truly a distinct separate practice from that of psychological counseling. Pause for a moment to chew on this question. Current psychological counselors who practice rational emotive behavior therapy or cognitive behavior therapy or logotherapy and existential therapy, therapy fully attest to the fact that they do use philosophical tools and resources in conducting their practice. In other words, these are psychological counselors who borrow, borrow extensively from philosophical doctrines and principles in their practice. They extensively use the insights of philosophers as a set of lenses to understand the troubles of their clients. And so they thus admit that there is great overlap of philosophical counseling and psychological counseling. In a lot of cases, philosophical counselors and psychological counselors may be actually doing the same thing. And herein lies the rub, because if philosophers are doing psychological counseling in the guise of, of psychological counseling, then they may be charged as intruding into the turf of psychologies. More specifically, philosophical counselors may be charged for illegal practice of psychology. Philosophical counselors are philosophers who practice psychology without a license. In many states of the United States, in, in, the, in many states of the U.S. and other countries, the practice of counseling is a protected practice. To legally practice counseling in a regulated context, one has to meet certain prescribed professional education and training, training requirements, fulfill certain standards of accountability, and in some cases, satisfy is statutory requirements of insurance, reporting, and supervision. And the fact right now is that psychologists have dominated the practice of counseling and have almost, almost made it their proprietary right. But thanks to the prudence of the vast community of practicing psychologists, they have not prejudged nor denigrated 
the fledgling movement of philosophical counseling, they have instead adopted a policy of accommodation and cooperation. Since philosophical counseling is now presented as a new specialization in the wide field of counseling practice, using competencies that differ from those required by other forms of counseling, it is and should be therefore welcome as a dev development. In the Philippines, we have a law passed in 2009 regulating the practice of psychology and in 2018, another law mandating the promotion of mental health and defining the stockholders. What is RA10029? It is what is known as the Psychology Act of 2009. It regulates the practice of psychology and psychometry in the Philippines. It requires passing a license or exams to practice psychology or psychometry. To qualify as a psychometrist, one is required only to have a bachelor's degree in psychology and pass the required board exam. On the other hand, for one to qualify as a psychologist, one needs an MA degree in psychology, pass the board exam, and 200 hours of supervised internship practicum or training in an institution or setting engaged in the de delivery of psychological services. And so in the Philippines, as in many other countries, psychological practice is now regulated. But there is as yet no law that regulates philosophical counseling practice. But if philosophical practice is charged of doing psychological service, then philosophical counselors can be at risk. It means that they cannot do it if they were doing psychological counseling. Now, I also cite another law that was passed in 2018, and this is what is known as the Mental Health Act, which mandates a state policy in the promotion of mental health in the country and the protection of the rights of mentally challenged individuals. And I think it is here that philosophical counselors indeed can insert themselves. They can insert themselves as precisely mental health practitioners or mental health professionals. I remember that this month, is aware, Mental Health Awareness Month. It is indeed fitting that we are talking of mental health, mental health right now. At any rate, there seems to be no legal deterrent to the establishment of philosophical counseling practice in the country today. It, in fact, philosophical counseling is totally unregulated, meaning it's not regulated by the state all over the world. This unregulated environment for PC practice is not conducive, however, for its growth because such an environment of no regulation, run the risk of debauchery or bastardization of the practice. It will not help in the efforts of philosophical counselors to professionalize their practice. So please take note of that. Now, in an environment that enhances awareness of the importance of mental health, 
and we must really try to appreciate what are the contributions of the different professionals. Now, what are the efforts of philosophical counselors in promoting their craft? What have they done or what are they doing in the efforts of promotion? Now, this topic has many aspects. It includes issues about public acceptance and credibility of the practice, ensuring competency and ethical conduct among practitioners, training and education relevant to PC practice. And it involves clarify, clarification of the responsibilities of the practitioner to the public. All these topics, however, are usually wrapped up in discussions of a broad topic on how the practice is or should be professionalized. In the earlier years of the PC movement, PC or philosophical counseling practitioners face difficulties about precisely how to, prove, to introduce the practice to the public. Back in the 1980s, Gerd Achenbach, the acclaimed founder of the movement based in Germany, he was based in Germany, he is noted to have opposed the regulation of PC practice. But after talking with Lou Marinov, after a decade of doing practice, he later on changed his mind and accepted that some measure of regulation must really be put into place in order to pro professionalize philosophical counseling. Now, in introducing philosophical counseling to the public, the philosophers have to navigate a landscape where terms such as counseling, therapy, coaching, mental health professional, mental health provider are protected or regulated in different forms and degrees. They have to walk through this terrain to ensure that their practice is going to be regarded by the public as credible, respectable, and professional. A practice that can legitimately claim a rightful place in the mental health survey, service domain. So what have they done? First, they have to increase brand awareness, so to speak. They have to increase awareness of the philosophical counseling brand. And in so doing, they really had to pin down exactly what is distinctively philosophical in the practice. They had to present their practice as sui generis, a form of counseling that is a class by itself. Given the sui generis character of PC, or philosophical counseling, it is not yet therefore covered by any existing regulations as those that are applicable, for instance, with psychological or psychotherapeutic counseling. But philosophical practitioners are proud to have created a new specialty in counseling. Now, what they want with their practice is professionalization. They do not mind at all the voices of resistance and sometimes condemning the practice. And the condemnation sometimes come from the ranks of mainstream academic philosophers. Skeptics call out PC practitioners and argue that philosophy cannot be subordinated to any practice. If philosophy is concerned with the truth, how can you subordinate the search for truth to any practice other than that? Secondly, 
skeptics tend to say that or would like to say that philosophy is and should not be a commercialized paid activity but philosophical practitioners dismiss these objections as mere intellectual hang-ups of ivory tower philosophers now the second the second uh, effort that philosophers that that philosophers have been doing to increase public awareness is to precisely move for the professionalization of their practice. It is doubtful if anyone at this time, even with those who are now practicing philosophical counseling, are earning a living by their practice. I believe that for most PC practitioners, it is not yet an occupation. To those who are practicing it, or those who aspire to practice it, they would, however, want it to be a profession rather than an occupation. Now, what is the difference between an occupation and a profession? Occupation is a job. It is what you are occupied with most of your working days or working time. It is one's way of earning a living or the job one is paid to do. On the other hand, a profession refers to a practice that involves special knowledge, extensive studies and training in a university or some institution of higher learning. Examples are doctors, lawyers, accountants, engineers, philosophers, and teachers. Now, it is good and desirable that one's profession is also at the same time one's occupation, but it's not, that is not always the case. There are doctors, there are people who are doctors by profession, but businessmen by occupation, lawyers by profession, but politicians by occupation, engineers by profession, but businessmen by occupation. In an ideal world, of course, it is nice that one's profession is also at the same time one's occupation. Now, let us now go to the movement for professionalization of practice. And there are supposedly at least three requirements for practice to be a profession. The first one is what is sometimes known as the normative criteria. This normative criteria refers to the fact that the practice must cater to the a delivery of a public good or service. There must be a, an identifiable public good or service served by the practice. For instance, lawyers serve the public good of justice, doctors physical health, teachers education, things like that. So there must be, this is what is known as normative criteria or one that refers to the good that is delivered by the practice. There must be really something like that. Number two, there must be an available set of knowledge and skills essential for the practice, uh, essential in that practice. This is sometimes known as the cognitive criteria. It also refers to supposedly the expertise of practitioners in, the, in that profession. Now, ensuring that cognitive criteria or expertise requirements is the task of regulation. The strictest and highest form of regulation is the imposition of licensure tests or examination because of the fact that philosophy is notorious as a home for serious but honest intellectual disagreements, then there can be no consensus useful for designing a license or test for philosophical practice. 
state legislation to institute licensure requirements for PC practice in the state of New York was once tried by Marinov in 1994, but he later abandoned this project. Thus, licensing seems to be out of the question as far as PC is concerned. Because of this state-mandated recognition or certification is also not possible. The option taken up by practitioners is peer certification. Practitioners form themselves into an association or organization devoted to growing and popularizing or improving their service. This is the model that has been adopted in many countries that now harbors nascent philosophical counseling practice. These associations periodically conduct education, training, and certification programs for those interested to go to the field. In their membership programs, they institute class levels and categories of expertise. And the number three requirement for a practice to be profession is the organizational criteria. There must be an organization that can enforce standards of performance, performance and behavior. These are the organization that they enforce ethical codes of conduct for the practice of the profession. And this precisely makes professional practice credible and trustworthy to the public. So we can assess the stage of growth or development of philosophical counseling practice according to these three criteria. Now, what is the present last landscape of philosophical counseling practice? How is it doing? First, I would like to note that there is indeed a notable growth of philosophical counseling practice all over the world. The practice is present in different parts of the world. The list is long it, and it includes Austria, Australia, Argentina, Belgium, Chile, China. See, it's all over the place. In fact, in April and May of last year, 2020, right at the first quarter of the COVID pandemic, there was an All India training seminar for philosophical counseling conducted by the APPA led by Marinov, Lija Amir, and Vona Firi. So the Indian, uh, Indian philosophers are already welcoming the practice of philosophical counseling in their shores. As late as last year, right in the middle of the pandemic. South Korea in July 2012 hosted the 11th International Conference on Philosophical Practice, where Korean professionals already practicing humanities therapy were introduced to philosophical counseling practice. And then in April of 2016, a group of 21 students, South Korean students, at the expense of their government, went to the City College of New York for a week-long seminar in philosophical counseling, led by Marinov, who is now the chair of the College of New York. The student's trip was rather quite successful, and supposedly those who have participated in the training have already started their practice. Now, the levels of practice in the different countries vary. In some countries, practitioners are isolated and do independent practice on their own without any formal organization. All they have is a loose network among themselves to compare practice and explore areas of cooperation. Countries that already, or that already have existing nation, national association of 
philosophical counselors are Germany. They have the German Society of Philosophical Practice. In the Netherlands, they have the Dutch Society for Philosophical Practice. And the UK, they have the Society for Philosophy in Practice. In UK also, philosophical practitioners are also members of either the UKCP or the UK Council for Psychotherapy and the BACP or the British Association of Counseling and Psychotherapy. In some countries where the practice is encouraged, there are now efforts to establish national associations, countries like Romania, South Africa, India, and South Korea. In several U.S. states, some practitioners have gained training and certification, had set up community-based philosophical practice, and have advertised their services by creating their own websites. Two examples are Curious Soul Philosophy. They have, it, it has its own website, founded by Monica Vilhar, and Merlin CCC, founded by Marisa diaz -Wian. I mentioned these two practitioners because to me, they provide a model template for the introduction of philosophy practice within relatively small communities and outside of academic institutions. Now, by country, the U.S. presently has the greatest number of PC practitioners. Most of them belong to either of the two U.S.-based International Association of Philosophical Counselors, namely the American Philosophical Practitioners Association, or APA, established in 1999 and headed by Lou Marinov. And the other one is National Philosophical Counseling Association, or NPCA. The latter is the oldest of the two being founded in 1991 with the original name of American Society for Philosophy, Counseling, and Psychotherapy. Both publish their own journals. They have their own, NCPA has its journal, International Journal of Philosophical Practice, and APPA publishes the journal entitled Philosophical Practice. Now, Membership in these two associations is not limited to Americans, but open to all practitioners all over the world. Both organizations offer certification programs for would-be practitioners in the form of educational training and seminars. They also conduct philosophical counseling conferences, philosophical cafes, and seminars across the United States and in other countries when they are so invited. Now, there is something interesting about the difference that is supposed to exist between these two institutions. In other words, there is no single umbrella to, that associate all PC practitioners in the US. So there is a rip, so to speak, or division between these two associations in the U.S. Elliot Cohen, the founder of NPCA, puts the difference in this way, and I give an extensive quote. He says, The keynote of the NPCA has always been that philosophical and psychological forms of counseling are complementary and mutually supportive avenues for helping people to confront their problems of living. Thus, from its inception, it has sought to bring philosophers and mental health practitioners together to share and make inroads to more efficacious modes of helping. In contrast, 
the APPA claims that philosophical counseling is distinct from psychological counseling and even has its own kind of client. It is, it claims, therapy for the same. According to the APPA website, not every personal problem is a mental illness. If you are physically ill or emotionally dysfunctional, see a doctor. But if you want to examine your life, see a philosophical counselor. Unquote. And so, what Cohen says is this, or I continue the quote rather, Cohen claims that this is unfortunate because it suggests that mental health professionals only treat the insane, and if you are sane, then you should speak to a philosopher rather than to a psychologist. The NPCA denounces such a dichotomy as bugos, misleading and alienating. Instead, it works with psychologists and other mental health practitioners to advance philosophical counseling without creating artificial barriers and turf battles. So, you see, the difference between APPA and NPCA is supposed to be ideological. NPCA thinks that there should, there should be a, a, a mix of psychological and philosophical counseling in the treatment of problems of everyday living. Lou Marinoff, that is of the APPA, Lija Amir, another member of the APPA, are not seduced about the marriage of philosophical counseling and psychological counseling. Both give the observation that persons have gone through psychological counseling therapy or healed of their psychological troubles would still have philosophical issues with themselves. In other words, even if you have gone through psychological counseling, there, it is possible that there still remains some philosophical issues with the individual. And so they think that they should really separate philosophical counseling from psychological counseling. My view on this matter about the difference between these two groups may not really be is that it, the difference may not really be ideological. Putting it as ideological gives it a very serious tone to it. The difference, I believe, is more like a difference of strategy on how to introduce the pra practice to the public. Cohen appears to take the view that the way to introduce PC philosophical counseling into the well-established counseling practice of profession is not to antagonize the psychology professionals. Philosophers entering the counseling arena should not overemphasize the difference between what they do and what psychologists do. For him, bifurcation of philosophy and psychology in dealing with mental health issues is simply bad and erroneous. It is unrealistic to expect that somebody seeking counseling has an exclusively philosophical or exclusively psychological problem because a mental health case can have many dimensions or underpinnings. Now, acting on this view, the NPCA actively welcomes and recruits psychotherapists and psychologists into the roster of members. The prospective effect of this is having members 
who can juggle both philosophical and psychological counseling practice in dealing with the client. More than that, philosophical counseling as it develops gets a ride, not probably a ride, but a hitch on the licensed practice of the psychologists and psychotherapies. Philosophical counseling in being served side by side with an already established counseling practice gets to acquire credibility and trust. In fact, in the NPCA website, it says that their philosophical counselors may apply their training in philosophical practice to the range of mental disorders ordinarily addressed by licensed mental health practitioners. Now, please take note of this, that in the language of the NPCA, philosophical counselors may now address mental disorders, not philosophical disorders or philosophical uh, issues sim simply. They can now address mental disorders because in their notion of a philosophical counselor, the philosophical counselor is expert in philosophical counseling known as logic-based therapy and at the same time, they are also already practicing psychologists or psychotherapies. So we have this. In the roster of membership of NPCA, the members that can do philosophical counseling are only those who hold a minimum master's degree in mental health area recognized from a graduate program and are licensed in the state in which they practice. And then it continues. This includes, but is not limited to, licensed mental health counselors, licensed professional counselors, licensed clinical social workers, clinical psychologists, and licensed marriage and family counselors, who, with this background, will still continue to have training in logic-based therapy or some modality of philosophical counseling recognized by the organization. Now, how about NPCA members who are not, who do not have these qualifications? In other words, they do not have license to do psychotherapy or psychological practice. NPCA creates a category of membership for them. For instance, if I am not a psychologist or psychotherapist and I want to join the NPCA, all and I, I can and for me to be able to do philosophical practice, I just undergo training in logic-based therapy or some modality of philosophical counseling that is recognized by them. And then I can practice not philosophical counseling, but what it terms as philosophical consulting. And so philosophical consultants can now address everyday problems like falling out or in love, or problems about marriage, problems about aging, work-related stress, and things like that. Now, this is really a very smart way of putting the kind of practice in such a way that philosophical counseling gets ahead, gets a hit on the license of, of practicing psychotherapists and psychologists. At any rate, APPA has its also has also its own categories of membership. For instance, in the APPA, if you examine its website, it has categories like appellates. Uh, counseling, these appellates are what it calls 
or what they call counseling and consulting professionals. They have categories of adjuncts, auxiliary plus, auxiliary members, and uh, what else? Yes, a student of philosophy or a friend of philosophical counseling or a supporter can be a member of APPA and they will be called auxiliary members. Students who have earned bachelor's degree in philosophy can become members of the APPA called auxiliary plus. Those philosophers who have not done any who have not done any training in philosophical like uh, counseling can become members of the APPA and they can be called adjuncts. But within the APPA, for you to be able to practice philosophical counseling, you have to be what they call an affiliate member. Now, whatever is the real difference between these two groups? They remain as the two most active associations now trying to promote philosophical counseling practice all over the world. With, now, philosophical counseling, therefore, is, is very active all over the place. It, philosophical counseling is also making headway into the master's degree programs of some universities. Those I have noted down in my research, master's programs now are available in Romania, Italy, India, of course in the US, and even in UK, including Canada. And so with this, I now end my presentation. And I hope that I have at least given you a motivation into the possibility of planting the roots of philosophical counseling practice in the Philippines. And I hope you continue to explore in greater detail the different ways by which we can bring the benefits of doing philosophy to our communities. Thank you all for listening. And at this You're juncture, welcome. we will hear another valuable insight from our guest commentator. To introduce him to us, let us welcome Sir Alexander Atrio Lopez, who is also a member of our UP Diliman philosophy faculty. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear myself. Okay, so Attorney Renato B. Manalotto is an assistant professor of philosophy at the UP Diliman, teaching in the Department of Philosophy courses like Phenomenology and Existentialism, Bioethics, Philosophy of Law, and Theories of Justice. And also he teaches in the Diploma in Bioethics and Master of Science in Bioethics joint programs, of the CSSP and the UP College of Medicine in UP Manila, courses like Law and Bioethics and Social Justice, Rights and Ethics. Currently, he is as well a lecturer at the College of Law teaching legal theory. So let us all welcome Sir Ato, um, who will deliver to us what I believe will be a short but insightful reaction. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Alex. Can you hear me loud and clear? Uh, yes, my internet connection uh, is notifying me that it is uh, sometimes uh, weak. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Alex and uh, Professor Vera Cruz. At a time when access to mental health care services is all the rage, especially during this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which does not spare anyone from experiencing emotional disturbances like, uh, at the very least, anxiety and worry, Professor Vera Cruz's lecture on uh, philosophical counseling is a breath of fresh air. While philosophical counseling is no longer new, as uh, Professor uh, Vera Cruz uh, pointed out, it was being practiced as early as the 1980s by, uh, in Germany by Gerd Aikenwald, 
and in the U.S. by uh, Lou Marinov, the author of uh, Plato, not Prozac, and in the U.K. by Emmy Van Dursen, also the leader of the uh, Psychotherapy Association. It was only in the early 2000s when it was introduced in the Philippines. And uh, as far as I know, it was uh, Professor Vera Cruz that introduced it by whenever appropriate embedding a discussion of uh, psychological counseling in his philosophy classes. In my case, I heard about uh, psychological counseling through the lectures given by Professor Vera Cruz in workshops or symposia organized by the Department of Philosophy or by philosophy student uh, organizations uh, such as Capitas or Philostock. Uh, Aperon did not exist yet at that time. And through the conversations we had in the Department of Philosophy faculty meetings, I had what I can say a formal learning of philosophical counseling by reading a copy of Plato, uh, not Prozac, which uh, that I borrowed from then a colleague, Professor Bing Mendoza, which I later learned he also borrowed from Professor Vera Cruz. After reading that book, I developed confidence in dealing with and managing my own emotional disturbances, especially those caused by my existential or meaning related uh, concerns by applying the peace approach introduced and developed by Lou Marinov himself. Peace is the acronym for problem, emotion, analysis, contemplation, and equilibrium. That is, know the problem, identify the emotion that comes with the problem, make an analysis, contemplation, that means make a deeper analysis until it results in equilibrium or well-balance. As Professor Veracruz discussed, philosophical counseling is an alternative counseling for those who are going through emotional disturbances like uh, anxiety, worry, anger, or depression. Uh, despite the, as uh, Professor uh, Veracruz discussed, despite the uh, attempt of uh, NAPCA and AAPA to erase the distinctions between these kinds of counseling, the fact remains that uh, whereas psychological or psychiatric counseling asserts that emotional disturbances are brain diseases or the results of emotional traumas, philosophical counseling considers these emotional disturbances linked to unclarified or unresolved issues indicative of the human condition, human values, and life itself. Philosophical counseling claims that uh, mental disturbances are best addressed by examining neither one's brain chemistry nor one's past traumas, rather by examining one's present intentions, volitions, desires, attachments, beliefs, and aspirations. Indeed, as uh, pointed out by Professor Vera Cruz, uh, and as attested to by those who practice it, philosophical counseling can help manage, if not resolve, many everyday problems, uh, ranging from personal predicaments to interpersonal conflicts, from coping with loss to leading a meaningful life, from finding oneself in a dreadful, in a dreadful pandemic to surviving it and becoming resilient to it, and so on. But there is a fly in the oatment. Uh, in fact, there are flies, not just one fly, but many flies in the ointment. As pointed out by Professor Vera Cruz regarding Lou Marinov's philosophical counseling practice, criticisms have been raised against it. 
philosophical counseling is being criticized, for example, for being a therapy for the sane, as pointed out by uh, Professor Vera Cruz, it is not for the mentally ill. Thus, it does not apply to the insane or those whose mental disturbances have absorbed them that they are not open to any advice or thinking anymore. Related to this criticism, as Professor Vera Cruz uh, discussed, quoting from Cohen, while philosophical counseling recognizes that there are mental disturbances requiring medical attention from a psychiatrist or a psychologist, it fails to set forth guidelines on what specific mental disturbances it can attend to and when it will or will not be resorted to. The different views from the groups of uh, philosophical counselors, especially in the US, do not help. Also, uh, philosophical counseling is criticized for failing to consider the potentially harmful effects of philosophy. As we know from personal experience, philosophy at times confuse, bewilder, frighten, and discourage that may cause greater emotional disturbance to the person concerned. So how can the philosophical counselor know if the counseling leads to such confusion, bewilderment, fear, or discouragement? Paano na lang yung magpapakounsel na sa una pa lang may S SD, uh, ST, societal tendencies. E paano kung along the way, he or she has interpreted the counseling as, oops, my plan to commit suicide can be confirmed by the ideas I get from the counseling. Also, uh, while Professor Vera Cruz observed that some psychologists or psychiatrists accommodated, philosophical counseling is generally frowned upon by not only other psychologists and psychiatrists, but also by some mainstream philosophers. Worse, as uh, Professor, Professor Vera Cruz pointed out, Philosophers are accused of illegal practice of psychological or psychiatric counseling, like what Lou Marinoff was accused of, in particular in 2002. Unless a law allowing the practice of uh, philosophical or psychiatric uh, of uh, philosophical counseling exists, philosophical counselors are at risk of legal liabilities. And worse, as uh, termed by Professor Vera Cruz, of bastardizing the craft rather than professionalizing it. Criticisms to it notwithstanding, philosophical counseling is a worthwhile endeavor, as explained and illustrated by Professor Vera Cruz. It is helpful not only to those who need an alternative counseling for their emotional disturbances, but using the term of uh, Professor Vera Cruz, also for us, or as pointed out by Professor v Vera Cruz, it is also beneficial for us who are into philosophy and want our philosophical activities to be relevant to the needs and demands of the greater society. If many of us have missed uh, Professor Veracruz since retiring because of his engaging philosophy of science or epistemology lectures, in my case, I have missed him more because of his authentic philosophical counseling ideas. I'm sure even on his retirement, Professor Veracruz will keep sharing as he does now his knowledge and expertise in philosophical counseling. And for those of us who want to learn or be trained in this counseling, 
for whatever reason, for profession or for occupation or for both, we should be ready to sit at his feet. Thank you.